will call the program to order. But being the first meeting of the new year, okay. but perhaps uh, we can accord each other our opportunities for greetings by way of introductions that the minister gets to hear. We'll start with you, sir, going this way. Good morning, Honorable. My name is Oswa Kapwaka from Branding. Good morning. My name is Angel Kapwaka from Christian Boys. Good morning, Honorable. My name is Balewa. So you say that again? Balewa. So, Balewa? Yuru. Yes, Zuru. Oh, Zuru. Yes. Z-Y-U. Okay. Good morning, Honorable Minister. My name is Shirika Chalagimura from Zanis HP. Good morning, Dr. Tumbeko. My name is Talbis Mchimba from Crown TV. Which one? Crown? Yes. Oh, we are in that for the first time. No. <laughs> Good morning, Honorable Minister. My name is Shimba Wode from Zambia Daily Mail. Okay. Good morning, sir. Good morning. My name is Nelson Njo from Zambia. Good morning, Honorable. My name is. What about this? <laughs> no, my name is Evander Simeon Ziyech from Zanis HQ. Okay. Good morning, Minister. My name is Elias Polisaisi. Mm -hmm. Good morning. My name is Patricia from KBN. From? KBN. KBN. Right there. Good morning. I'm Julia Chanda from United Good morning. I don't know. Thank you very much indeed, and uh, 
to my colleagues here at the Ministry of Finance and the colleagues from the media. First of all, I want to say Happy New Year and I wish each and every one of you and your families a prosperous and good New Year, good 2024. As Mr. Gandeta has just said, um, <coughs> this is a new year. We will call you uh, later this month so that we provide a report on the economic performance of the year 2023. Right now, we have bits and pieces of information, but bulk of the data coming to the end of the year is still being collected, still being analyzed. So we are not at this stage able to provide a comprehensive report of economic performance in 2023. We'll do that at a later stage. What I'll do now is just to say to you uh, the 2024 budget was passed on the uh, 15th of December last month, and uh, we are now hearing ourselves for the implementation of that budget. Hearing ourselves for the implementation of that budget. Some of the key things take notes that we implement include the fact that first of all we will adhere we will strictly adhere with one of the key tenets that this administration has driven since coming to office that is the issue of the credibility of the budget Credibility of the budget means when Parliament allocates money for various items, there was a tendency in the past for the actual displacement of the money to be something else compared to what Parliament has uh, approved. So, for example, you see here Parliament approving money for CDF, but then when it came to disbursement, either it was reduced, or in fact, in two years, nothing was disbursed before at all, at, at all. Now here, you change from all that. The budget must be credible, because a budget is law. That's why that's you hear about the appropriation law. Budget is law. And in the manner that Parliament approves what they are going to spend the money on, the officers here will be in charge with the responsibility of making sure that that is the case. But I also want to thank my colleagues in government, starting from the President himself to everybody else, because sometimes when the budget is not credible, it is because the moment that budget is uh, arrived at, the moment the budget is uh, closed, then pressure arises from the government to change this because there's some emergency that is calm and so forth. But in the last two years that this government has been administration, colleagues, the president have all been wonderful. They've supported the concept of budget credibility and this is the main reason why when we say there will be money for hiring teachers, the money will be available. When we say there will be money for uh, CDF, the money is available because nobody in between introduces uh, new things and disturbs the budget. So we will continue under 2024 um, to exercise uh, credibility. The second element 
that cuts across the budget is that of adhering to the borrowing plan. You recall that where we are seated today, we are still battling with the issues of how to solve um, the unsustainable debt that was left behind. That unsustainable debt happened because, in a sense, the goal keeping that the Minister of Finance is supposed to exercise, making sure that borrowing is controlled from one place, the treasure. Unfortunately, that seems to have broken down, and uh, the result is what we have seen. So, second important element is to ensure that borrowing plan and everything that goes with that, getting parliamentary approval uh, before you borrow, we are going to stick uh, with that element. So those are some of the most important uh, tenets or characteristics of the 2024 budget. So at this stage, let me remind you of some of the most important um, issues that are 2024, the one that we are going to implement. Um, first of all, we say that the 2024 budget is roughly about 178 billion quarter. So the resource envelope we have 2024 is 178 uh, billion quarter. Most of that, of course, will come from uh, domestic revenues. About 80% of that will come from domestic revenues. So that's the budget that we have that we are going to uh, implement in 2024. Now, in terms of uh, what we are going to spend that money on, let me give you or remind you of the highlights some of the there. Um, there were three pillars of what we are going to spend money on. Pillar number one, economic transformation and job creation. Pillar number two, human and social development. Pillar number three, environmental sustainability. And uh, Pillar number four was good governance. So let's go to pillar number one. Highlights. Highlights. The economic transformation is 40 billion quarter. The major areas in there, um, the roads, have been allocated 8.3 billion. And I want to commend my colleagues from the Minister of Infrastructure. The amount of money going into the road sector is fairly modest compared to what the sector did receive in the last decade. But this money that is going to this sector is being used very prudently. We've seen uh, stretches of roads being repaired, even here in Lusaka, uh, elsewhere. So every quarter is stretching to do uh, a good job. But on top of that, of course, we are riding on the appetite of the private sector to fund roads. Chimbola to Kasumbales, as we speak. Uh, you have been there, up and running, done within less than one year by the private sector under PPP arrangements, and it's a masterpiece. Last year, this time, you recall, the congestion of that road going to Kasumbalesa, it was coming all the way to the Mfuyura Tenor, from Kasumbalesa all the way to the Mfuyura Tenor. You go there now, congestion has disappeared. Why? Because traffic is moving fast, the road is good. 
So that innovation, uh, this year we expect that the Indola Mufurira will similarly be sorted out. Uh, so that people going to Mufurira from Indola don't have to go all the way to Kitwe. Uh, this year, 2024, that will all be sorted out, again using PPPs. Um, of course, Usaka Indola, the flagship, already some works have started, some of the bad portions have been sorted out before. But we feel now, 24, 25, 26, we accept the pure carriageway to be uh, completed. Still within the sector of economic transformation and job creation, agriculture, fisheries, and livestock gets 13.8 billion out of the 40. Um, this is for things like Animal disease control, physic, fertilizer support program, purchase of grains, and uh, hopefully that looking at uh, driving around some parts of the country, it looks like the response from farmers has been uh, looks good. Of course, we wait for the actual uh, survey to be done, but casual observation so far shows that uh, there's been a good response across the country. Many farmers have planted, the maize is growing well. And uh, with a better price for the farmers, we expect more maize to be grown this year. Those who went to soya bean and the others will come back to maize. So uh, we are hopeful that uh, this will bring relief. Within economic transformation and job creation, uh, issues of CDF. Last year, 2023, CDF constituency, CDF constituency was 28.3 million budget. In 2024, 2024, CDF constituency will be 30.6 million, so it has increased. 30.6 million CDF. So we expect to see the countryside continuing to transform, especially more classes being uh, constructed, more teachers' houses being constructed, more home water being uh, sunk, clinics being brought nearer and nearer to the communities, police stations, <coughs> police stations to protect our people being constructed all over the country, and of course, empowerment schemes within this CDF to continue to make sure that every child who can make it goes to secondary school because this is the money that we use for paying there. Sorry, it's not the CDF. The CDF we use it for boarding, tuition, something different. The tuition comes from this um, grants school grants. School grants which used to be 300,000. 300,000. Sorry, not 300,000. Uh, 300 quarter in certain cases in the past. School in a quarter would get 300 quarter. Now those schools, especially the big ones, high schools and so forth, the quarter that now goes as high as how much? One school. For some schools, to get school grants as high as two million. Most of the primary schools will get something like ten thousand to eight thousand, depending on the size. So the issues of a school having no chalk, that is history. The stories of a school uh, not having a, uh, the basic requirements, uh, including desks. Of course, this is also being funded from CDF. So we see our children getting better and better education. On, so that is a pillar number one, economic transformation and job creation. Let me quickly go to human and social development, which gets 60 billion quarter. Out of this, the biggest share goes to education, which comes to 27.4 billion quarter. 
and uh, for this money, we are going to spend money to recruit another 4,200 teachers. So 2024, 4,200 teachers will be hired, uh, and then other non-teaching civil servants, 1,200. But I'm happy personally about uh, more and more teachers being hired. Of course, if you look at a person like me and many people of our generations, we're able to contribute to the course of the education that we're able to see from the government then. Uh, if it had been left to our parents, we would not be here today uh, with you. And we know that millions and millions of children, before this policy came in place, they were not able to go to school because their parents were not able to afford to pay tuition fee. Their parents were not able to afford to pay uh, uh, boarding fees. And colleagues, if you look at the modern economy, there are some people that I see in social media saying, why are you investing so much in social uh, sectors? They forget that the modern economy today it hinges on education. The modern economy today is no longer just about fiscal power, human beings with fiscal power. It is about human beings who are knowledgeable, those who are able to manufacture phones, those who are able to write computer programs or software for phones. That's where these jobs of today are headed to. Even in a restaurant, we are expected to know how to operate an uh, iPad or things like that. So if we don't educate our people, then it is doomed. So this is why we were able to say the subsidies that is going on fuel, for people like me to go and buy cheaper fuel, I'm sorry, that subsidy must now shift to education. That's what we've done. People are asking, how did you afford it? It's a matter of priorities. It's a matter of priorities. Instead of giving me money to go and buy cheap fuel, when the schools have no teachers, when the schools have no books, when the schools have no chalk, when children are failing to go to school, what we've decided is that the subsidy must go to uh, education. So we are happy with this. Health also receives a huge amount, at uh, almost 21 billion quarter in 2024. And the key features of health also, we are going to recruit 4,000 health personnel in 2024. 4,000 health personnel. This is of course good for our young people who have been training as nurses, as paramedics, as doctors. Um, but much more important, these human beings are needed. These human beings are needed. So we'll continue to recruit. Then um, we'll continue constructing and uh, completing some of the hospital cleaning facilities that we are not completed for the past years. Importantly, the five billion out of this is for procuring medicines and uh, medical supplies. Five billion. So I'm happy that I think the problem that we've seen in the past of money being available, but drugs not being available, in other words, failure to procure, I'm happy to say that uh, this has now been uh, resolved and increasingly we see the supply of drugs. Uh, improving all over the place. Now, colleagues, some of these things, it is about uh, making sure that uh, it's not. when you have a problem, everyone is going to face a problem. In life, we cannot deny problems. Problems are going to emerge. The most important thing is that as an individual, as a family, as a country, when you face problems, are you able to quickly find solutions to those problems? And I'm happy that in this administration, 
yes, we had the problem of the track and liability, but the system responded, and now we are getting on track. Finally, under this column, 3.9 billion for the public service pension fund. Here yeah, again, I'm happy because I think you all recall from your parents, brothers, uncles, in the past, somebody to retire. And it took years, two years, three years, four years before they get their dues. With this amount of money, we are continuing to make sure that you retire within a London journal, three months within three months from retirement, somebody's getting paid their dues. So all those problems, your lucky colleagues, those of you who work for Lanis, uh, Minister of Information and so forth, when you retire, you want you to wait for uh, three, four years before you get paid, paid three months after retirement. So just make sure that uh, uh, even by the time when you are retiring, I see some of you are young. Even by the time you are retiring, will be a government such as ours that is responsible enough to make sure that when you retire, you get paid. Um, under the column environmental sustainability, um, I think this is basically uh, protection measures across the environment. And um, the last column on government, good governance, there were a number of things there, uh, but basically this is why we talk about the credibility of the, the budget itself, and making sure that we don't overbore. So I thought I would just remind you of uh, what we passed in Parliament uh, recently which we are now going to implement going forward. Now, on the implementation part of it, I believe that certain things that are normally done, like the school grants, director budget, I believe the school grants have gone. Yes, they have. When did they go? They went, uh, today is on Tuesday. On Tuesday. So on Tuesday, school grants were already transmitted to the schools. So that by the time the school children arrive, everything is, is in place. Uh, what remains now is the portion of the CDF that supports boarding. The portion of the CDF that supports children in boarding schools. When are we putting that out? We are planning to get that out on the course of next week. So on the course of next week, uh, the CDF components going to the councils for each constituency to support children in boarding schools, that money will go. So this is, these are examples of what we talk about, credibility of the budget. Because otherwise, you find a situation whereby the schools open, there are no school grants. So the schools open, the children arrive at school, we come to boarding, they are told, sorry, go back because there is no food, the treasury has not released the money. The money will be released on time. So these are examples of things that we have already put in place to make sure that the 2024 uh, budget is uh, implemented. Lastly, uh, let me talk a bit about uh, borrowing, because this is what either increases or reduces the debt. In this budget that we are going to, 2024, the government was authorized by parliament to borrow 33.3 billion quarter. 33.3 billion quarter which is a measure of GDP is 5.2%. Um, I think a few years ago, this percentage was much bigger than 5.2%. 14%. 14%. 14%. 
for 2020 was 14%. Yeah. So what government was borrowing as a ratio of the GDP was 14%. Um, now, this ratio sometimes confuses people, but just take it that time. It's like when a doctor wants to measure some of those uh, parameters, some of those indicators that the doctor uses to check whether the patient's health or not. What do they do? They measure the temperature, they measure the blood pressure, they may measure the uh, other things. So for economists, when you want to measure one of the criteria for determining whether what you are borrowing is sustainable or not, the equivalent of taking a thermometer and putting it in your arm to measure temperature, for us, the equivalent of that is to check is the ratio of what we borrow compared to the size of the GDP of the economy, is that reasonable compared across or not? It used to be 14% 2020 for next year. For this year, it has fallen from 14% to 5.2%. All is part of the effort to reduce debt. There are some people who are saying, why are you still borrowing? Yes, we are still borrowing because we can't just abruptly stop like that. But what you can see here is a gradual reduction of that borrowing as the size of the economy as a measure, as a practical and tangible measure to drive debt up to sustainability. Of this 3.3 billion, um, most of this is actually borrowed domestically. Oh, the are about the same. Domestic borrowing is 16.3 billion, and the external is 17 billion. So yes, we are borrowing, but remember, the key thing is, is this borrowing relative to the size of the economy declining or increasing? And the answer is that this borrowing relative to the size of the economy is significantly reducing. That's why you should not pay attention to those who are saying government is back again, borrowing, uh, borrowing. It's a different story altogether. If the debt was rising those days, the economy was shrinking. That's why you are this paradox of you are getting poorer and poorer, but your debt burden is getting higher and higher. So that is now the best, that is now uh, the best. So let me stop here, and I'll be very delighted to respond to some of the questions that you may have. I have a whole range of experts here, those who are experts in budget, the ST is here, the Council General is here, the Auditor is here. We read in charge of borrowing at the very end there, so I have a lot of backup to assist to answer questions. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. So as indicated when we began the, the, the program, the Minister and the team are going to come back to us with the performance of the 2023 uh, budget in a few weeks' time. Therefore, may I request that uh, as you indicate your wish to ask, you consider focusing on what we have discussed and the budget for 2024. We have somebody to start the process. And get the name once again and the institution. Yes, there's a gentleman there and the other one here. Just stand so that you can not hear you from here. Honorable Minister, what measures are you putting in place to navigate through the budgetary pressures that may arise as a result of the delayed uh, uh, date restructured? considering that some external financing is aligned to completion of the data yeah, I think it was more of the same question, it's a bit of a TV, but maybe I would also uh, 
uh, your response on the concern that uh, you, are keep, you are really keeping updates on the uh, debt restructuring process. This was raised by one uh, political leader. Yes, gentlemen, the gentleman good, and then the other one. Then we, we take another round after that. Uh, Angel Castle from Christian Voice. Um, so I just wanted to get a clarification on the school grants. Um, uh, the readings for the funds, is it for the whole year or uh, per term? So, and how much? Maybe I should start responding to some of this. Delayed debt structuring and the consequences on the budget. Um, there are no consequences on the budget, as far as I can tell now. Remember, there are two main categories of who we owe the creditors. The official creditors, that is government to government, and the private creditors. Official creditors, as you recall, we already agreed with them. They provided the relief, which we described to you earlier I mean, during last year. The relief was provided. And after that relief was provided, in the budget that we have today, as far as servicing the official creditors on the basis of very structured debt with the relief, that money is already provided for. So nothing uh, changes. On the private creditors, on the private creditors, because we have not yet concluded agreement with them, and at some stage, uh, I'll ask the ST to give you an update on where we are on that. But because we have not agreed with them yet on how to restructure the debt, what was introduced a few years ago, the debt stands still. In other words, suspension of debt, servicing of debt, suspension of the servicing of debt that still remains in place. Okay, that still remains in place. Therefore, uh, as long as we have not yet agreed, that debt remains not to be serviced. Um, if we come to an agreement, and we hope that this happens to be so, then I believe that uh, in the 2024 budget, um, but the experts are here. I think we may have uh, made provisions on the basis of on the basis of restructured uh, debt. So for now, uh, there are no consequences. The failure to um, give updates on debt, debt, I disagree with that assertion. If anything, I think we've been a ministry that gives updates in those quarterly meetings, we give updates in press briefings such as this one, we give updates on the website, we give updates. But once I've answered these questions, 
the ST will provide the latest update. School grants is the whole year or just on term and how much the director of budget will answer to that. Then the last issue was uh, prices are going up because you removed uh, subsidies on fuel. But you claim that parents are no longer uh, faced with the burden of education. <laughs> so in your question, you are implying that uh, what the parents have saved because they no longer pay tuition fees, they no longer pay um, boarding fees, that has been overtaken by rising prices. Well, my answer is that yes, price has been going up, inflation has been going up, but remember, this inflation that we are still facing is still lower than what we found. We found inflation at almost 23-24%. Inflation is falling. In other words, prices are rising, yes, but they are rising much slower than what was there before we came into office. But nevertheless, your issue is when prices are rising, uh, is it not the case that, uh, in fact, the parents are suffering because prices have gone up, fuel subsidies, fuel subsidies have been removed, and therefore uh, education has become subsidies on education is swallowed up by that. I don't quite agree. I don't quite agree. I don't quite agree in the sense that uh, the burden on the school children especially for people in the rural areas who are not beneficiaries of uh, uh, fuel subsidies. Yes, some prices have gone up, but when you look at the uh, consumption basket of a typical rural dweller, if you look at the consumption of a typical rural dweller, the sort of thing that they consume mostly are things that they themselves provide for themselves. Okay. They grow their food, perhaps not all the food, but there's no doubt about the fact that maybe 70-80% of what they eat is something that they uh, prepare for themselves. Uh, they don't have water bills, they don't have electricity bills. So for the typical rural dweller, and who are the majority of the people in this country? The biggest burden on them was to send their child to school. Tuition those days was something like 600 bucks. Boarding, more than 1,000. That's why they were training to send their children to school. Now they can afford to send their children to school because that financial burden has been removed away from them. Some prices, yes, that they consume, they've gone up, but compared to the increase of the few items that they consume which have responded to price rises, compared to this burden that they could not avoid of paying tuition, paying school fees, I can assure you that the majority of them are better off uh, today. That is not to say that uh, some section of society uh, there's some pain, that is true. But when you look, because policies like this, you look at the majority. You look at the majority, the majority of the people are those out in the rural areas uh, whom education has become a luxury because they cannot afford. ST and the director of budget. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. Um, speak louder because the microphone oh, in front of Thank you, thank you very much, Honorable Minister. Here, yeah. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. And um, since the phones are here, probably I'll also respond on behalf of the Director of Budget. Um, and let me start with that. Um, the total amount that was released for the first quarter, so we released the grants on a quarterly basis. So the total amount released for the first quarter was 518 million quarter. 
um, in terms of um, how much did each receive, um, it ranges, the minimum is about 30,000 kwacha, the maximum is about 2 million kwacha, and the minister explained why. It depends on the size of the school, the number of pupils, and uh, all those factors that we put in. So 518 million, 30,000 minimum, 2 million maximum as school grants per quarter. So 30,000 is exactly what the, min the minister was saying, that it was from 300 to about 10,000, because a quarter is three months, so 30,000 means 10,000 uh, per month uh, to the lower schools. Now, just before I answer the question on the debt restructuring and the disclosure not announcing, I just want to ask a question to you as journalists. How many of you saw the um, press release we issued at the time that we discontinued the negotiations on 17th of November 2023. How many of you saw that? None of you saw that. Now, if you haven't seen, and I'll ask Mr. Kandeta to reproduce it so that you see. The release is very detailed. First and foremost, we talk about what the negotiations were and what led us not to reach agreement. Second, we will go further to start publishing why we are releasing that information. In terms of the regulations that govern bondholders or, uh, or, 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 or market in the EU, in terms of the regulations that cover those instruments in the US, and in terms of the regulations that cover those instruments elsewhere, the Bond instruments are live instruments being traded. Even as we are uh, addressing this uh, conference, the people that are trading in the bond markets are on their computers. And if we are careless, someone else loses out, someone else wins, or Zambia may end up losing out. Before we start any discussions with the people that we are discussing with, the Minister of Finance signs a non-disclosure agreement. The people that we are discussing with countersign that non-disclosure agreement. And there is an agreement that for the period that we are discussing, none of us should go to the press and talk. Because if we did that, the steering committee of the bondholders, Zambia's bondholders, just hold probably 20% of the bonds. 80% are not in that committee. If we were to discuss and publish that information every time, it means the 20% will benefit, the 80% will lose, isn't it? And it means the Zambian government will lose because the 20% that have got the inside information will use it to trade those live instruments that are tradable every day. We even go ahead and say for purposes of making sure the market is fair, that those instruments stop trading for the period we are negotiating. And once we finish that, it is by market standard and by requirement that then we go to the public and release that information. So when a political uh, uh, person or when uh, someone says that we are not disclosing, please check this information is on the Minister of Finance website every time that we make some progress, or that we have to attempt to do the negotiation, we do publish this information. It's a standard requirement. And the last we publish is on the Minister of Finance website, and it is a detail. Please, your journalists, you read it through and see the details and the requirement, then you understand. So that next time when a political party or a person says we are not disclosing, you can be able to challenge them and understand why we are not disclosing. We don't want to dent the market for political expedience. We want our instruments to continue performing. And we are measured by those instruments in the international market. I thought I should just say that, Honorable Minister. Thank you very much. Mr. Considering the statement you referred to, it was shared with the police. Just check 14th November on our platform. You'll find it. And many of them used it for their news and reports. 
But really? instead of just reading the headline, just go down. It is probably a two or three page that are giving the rules which we are following as they apply in America, as they apply in the EU, and as they apply everywhere else, including what are those rules, what are the numbers of those rules, and what do those rules require for us to do. We have published all that information. Thank you very much. We'll take another set of questions. We have ladies, we'll start with Madam. Okay, um, this one goes to uh, the SG. I want to find out when is the country likely to start engaging the bondholders, especially that now it's 2024, it's a new year, and the date has been dragging. Yes, we'll take the gentleman. Yes, please, yourself. Honorable Minister, for the past um, two years, the government has been consistent in um, reducing the constituency development fund, the annual allocations. Uh, this year, you have announced a 30.6 million uh, allocation. Uh, but a latest report by the Ministry of Local Government indicates that some constituencies that is quite poor, despite governments ensuring that these monies are released as and when um, uh, needed. What would be your, your uh, way of advice going into 2024 to uh, the constituencies and councils and to ensure that um, the uptake of the CDF matches the releases uh, by the Treasury. Thank you. And with Reuters and the gentleman then we allow the Senate to respond. Yes, it's the last time the government said stopping the own borders and the official creditors to sit down with the borders and finances. How far have we gone? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, mine is on the introduction of the uh, 60% excise duty uh, for local produced alcoholic uh, beverages. Now, on the ground, uh, there is an outcry of uh, increased counterfeit and uh, smuggled alcohol and uh, illicit production and cheaper inputs of, on, on resale of uh, these uh, alcohols. Um, as government, how are you going to work out with uh, the local manufacturers to ensure that there is fair competition on the market? In the sense that when uh, there is illicit inflows of uh, commodities such as alcohol, what happens is that the prices are even sold at a cheaper price. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure my colleagues are there with me. It was Christmas and uh, New Year, they were buying some cheaper commodities there. Thank you. You may respond. Okay, let me start. Um, I think I'll take the middle one. Yes, uh, government has been consistent year in, year out, releasing money for CGF, and the absorption rate has been slower. The attitude of government is that this will not deter us. Okay, this will not deter us. We have to soldier on. And already um, we can begin to see improvement in the absorption compared to when we started. There's definitely been improvement. Uh, we still do we still need to do a lot more, but uh, definite improvement. So this improvement has come through because partly the CDF Act itself had elements that um, introduce elements that encourage bureaucracy and uh, other forms of uh, poor response. Then there was also issues of the uh, Public Procurement Act itself, in certain areas. Um, it was a hindrance. Then the Public Finance Act itself, the act that governs how public money is supposed to be managed, also had issues that created problems. So in the past year or two, we've been going those step by step, changing laws, changing regulations. Uh, and this is what is 
help to improve the situation. Obviously, we are not yet there, but as I said, we will not relent. We will address all the issues, all the problems, one by one, including one of human beings. Council employees, council employees and their responsiveness, communities and their responsiveness, all those are issues that we are addressing to make sure that the obstacles one by one are broken down. So the fact that there has been improvement for me is a very good encouragement and we will continue to address these issues. Uh, ST, the issue of the bondholders and the tax issue. So thank you, thank you very much, Honorable Minister. Probably just again, um, obviously we were not looking for the bondholders and the private creditors to agree. Um, um, I mean, the, the official creditors to agree. Um, it is the government um, that negotiates with the official creditors and that negotiates with the, um, the bondholders and that negotiates with the other private creditors. So we have got three categories the bondholders, the official creditors, and other private creditors other than the bondholders. And uh, it's our job to uh, negotiate with them. Um, when do we resume engagement? We have never uh, suspended the, engage uh, the engagement. We have always engaged. Uh, the bondholders are represented by their advisors, and we are represented by our advisors. And at, at advisory level, under the non-disclosure agreement that I talked about, um, we continue um, uh, to engage. And, and um, the only thing that we said was that before we go to the steering committee of the bondholders that have been mandated to negotiate with the bondholders, that we needed to make sure that we have the same understanding and the same terminology and the same meaning of what we mean by comparability of treatment. Um, comparability of treatment does not mean equal treatment, but it means that they, we treat the same, we treat uh, them in different ways, uh, but achieving the same results. Um, and that is what was the issue at the time that we presented the report um, to the official creditor committee. Uh, you recall that when we presented the report to the official creditor committee and the IMF, um, the IMF we are looking at compatibility with um, the debt sustainability parameters. And with the IMF, we determined that uh, the proposal we are presenting was compatible with the DSA, um, but the uh, colleagues from the official creditors were saying that the bondholders needed a bit more effort in order to meet the comparability of treatment. And the question that we needed to be defined and agreed is what does this comparability of treatment uh, mean now? Obviously, this, this is one of the challenges of being uh, the front runners because I sit on the uh, Global um, Sovereign Debt Round Table uh, representing Zambia as a deputy to the minister. And even up to now, as we talk, we have not yet agreed, even at that level, how to measure uh, comparability of treatment or what should constitute comparability of treatment or what is in that comparability of treatment and we are trying to find the common understanding. And the reason why we said that instead of us to continue engaging and we suspended was for us to be able to engage, us as Zambia, not as bondholders, but us as Zambia, to be able to engage with the official creditor committee secretariat and to use the official creditor committee secretariat to bring the official creditor as to be able to agree on what we are going to define as comparability of treatment uh, that would be able to be accepted. And on 17th November 2023, we did have that meeting where we engaged and we agreed on what work should be done and our colleagues are undertaking that work. In terms of when do we want this to be concluded, obviously our view is that this should be concluded immediately and obviously um, our understanding with uh, everyone else is that this should be able to be concluded um, not later than the first quarter of 2024 and we're hoping that everyone would come uh, on board and we should be able to conclude with this. And in terms of engagement, we are continuing to engage 
With the bondholders, of course, we are looking at that. We are engaging with the private creditors, other private creditors. We are sharing non-disclosure agreements. We are giving them our feeling of what it should be uh, that should be presented. They are giving us their feeling of what they understand and what we should be so that we agree on the terminologies and we are discussing and negotiating um, on where we could be able um, to go. And obviously, um, we have not reached a point where we can then be able to present and be able to come um, to you and that uh, we are uh, we are still uh, discussing uh, on that um, in terms of the question on the exercise duty and the introduction of the 60 uh, percent um, uh, intended to harmonize of course we understand that there is smuggling but smuggling is tax evasion tax evasion is a, 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 an offense and an offense when such person who invests tax, tax, uh, tax is, uh, is found, they meet the consequences. How can we improve tax evasion? Uh, we are doing a lot of um, uh, 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 work in that area. And in the minister's budget speech, he announced some of the reforms um, that we are putting in tax administration to make sure that we meet the challenge of some of this tax evasion, including the electronic invoicing for VAT, and our colleagues at the Zambia Revenue Authority have been piloting the electronic invoicing and sensitizing to make sure that um, uh, um, um, taxpayers come on board uh, so that they cannot be able uh, to evade tax. And um, um, obviously, our objective is to make sure that we promote local uh, manufacturing, local, uh, local production, and um, that we provide a fair competitive environment uh, for local producers. And all these measures, tax administration measures that we're undertaking are to ensure that uh, we, we curtail as much as possible uh, on, on, on tax evasion. Um, uh, and two ways, one is obviously that we are modernizing the Zambia Revenue Authority, um, uh, making sure that we introduce um, um, uh, um, uh, um, the technology that would be able to match um, um, uh, the 21st century uh, technology in tax collection. Um, two is that uh, obviously um, uh, we uh, 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 now, ZRA is even now working with the local authorities and appointing the local authorities as agents to help them monitor that and to make sure um, that we address that. And the third one, and especially on the beer and cigarette, um, we are also looking at um, how effective and efficient we can use the tax stamps on those products to make sure that the products that do not have the tax stamps are products that are reported. And how do we intend to make sure that this uh, works? Uh, we intend to make sure that this works by giving you the responsibility of the people that go to drink and smoke cigarette in those areas where we find this, giving them the responsibility. If you find someone is selling this and report, and we give you an award, and we probably will give you, probably will tell you that from that bar where you are drinking from, we'll make sure that the next weekend that you go there, you drink beer for free. And we are very sure that most of you will be able to report. And the people that are selling that product, immediately they know that you, the buyers, are going to report when you find that they are selling counterfeit products, they will make sure that they don't sell because they know that they will be caught. So um, they may be ahead of us, but I can assure you uh, that uh, we are uh, catching up uh, with them uh, soon and very soon. Um, I think those are the ones that I have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Soon and very soon we will catch up on the performance of the 2023 national budget when we convene again in a to extend, but perhaps at this point in time, we may seek some final thoughts from the owner of Mr. and Beans, the program uh, Thank you very much. Uh, I think by way of concluding, I want to thank everybody here. We are obviously also hopeful that the economic performance in 2024 should see improvements uh, in that. Uh, we should see improvements because some of the key sectors that struggled this year, more especially the mining sector, 
we are on the way to uh, getting those uh, results. So Copper Belt once again come back to life. But we know that uh, when the Copper Belt is alive, it's not just the Copper Belt, the effects trickle down to the rest of the country. Uh, and then, of course, this coming year, the president has already declared it's a year where we're going to see a lot of actions taking place. The um, farming blocks that we've talked about and budgeted for uh, is part of the 2024 budget. And this coming year, we want to move away from talking about what has been provided from the budget to actual work uh, getting started. Similarly for the tourism sector. And of course, the various incentives that we've provided over the years, we see those uh, having an impact on manufacturing and other sectors. Already, I think uh, we see a big push on the manufacturing sector. Uh, in the next uh, few weeks, those of you who will be available, you can come and visit with me the North Facility Economic Zone. When, when are we doing that? Within the next two weeks. Yeah, we'll get back to you. Yes, you will visit the Osaka South Mod Facility Economic Zone, which has now run out of space because investors have moved in. Uh, we'll visit others. So uh, make a date with us. Once again, I want to thank you for coming over, we look forward to meeting you shortly when we come and report for the 2023 budget and also give an update on the economic performance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. That brings the program to a close.